As the clocks tick down to midnight on December 31st, 1999, as each final second of the last millennium slipped away, people all over the world collectively held their breath. If all the hype was to be believed, if the Y2K threats were real, their New Year's merrymaking, the fireworks, the champagne, the confetti, might all come crashing down amidst terror and chaos, the apocalypse. Would the power go out? Would planes fall out of the sky? Would there be some giant explosion? What was going to happen? There was only one way to find out. And then, nothing. Nothing happened. In the decades since, Y2K, or the Millennium Bug, has been dismissed as nothing more than a hoax. Media hype gone way too far. But did you know, the threat was more real than many of us realize? Let's fix that. Hello, I'm Shay LaFontaine, and you're listening to History Fix, where I discuss lesser-known true stories from history you won't be able to stop thinking about. I remember New Year's Eve 1999. I was 11, but I remember it all so clearly. I remember where I was, what I did, who was with me. I remember running out into the street at the stroke of midnight, screaming and hollering and blowing into noisemakers with my friends, no jackets on, freezing cold, exhilarated, giddy. One of those moments where you just feel so alive, the adrenaline leading up to that moment, the anticipation all exploding in one instant. And then that was it. The moment passed and we walked back inside, smiling and shaking our heads. Nothing had happened. But did we ever really think something was going to happen? Or was it just fun to hype ourselves up, a welcome escape from the dull monotony of normal life? I decided on that day, January 1st, 2000, that Y2K was never real. Just a hoax. Just some sick joke the world had played on itself. And then I left it behind, like the last millennium itself, and moved on. When I realized this episode would go live on New Year's Eve, I knew I wanted to do something New Year's themed. Y2K seemed a fitting topic. I thought I'd expose this old hoax, this scam that worked us all up into a frenzy back in 1999. Where the idea came from, why it caught on, that sort of thing. It's certainly an interesting phenomenon, not unlike the Maya calendar debacle that unfolded 12 years later. There's something innately interesting about a doomsday prophecy, whether real or imagined. But then I started to do some research. It's the first I've ever looked into it, if I'm being honest. Like I said, I left the whole notion of Y2K behind on that cold street back in those first few moments of 2000. Left it behind and moved on. But once I started to actually look into it for this episode, I realized my angle was all wrong. I'm not exposing a hoax because Y2K was never a hoax. It was a surprisingly real threat, one diffused by countless hours of work, as many as 400 man years of work per large company, according to IBM, and as much as $600 billion, according to Gartner Research Firm, which today is equivalent to just over $1 trillion. Many of the sources I found proclaimed that Y2K was only thought of as a hoax in the aftermath of the frenzy because an army of computer programmers and IT guys worked feverishly to correct the issue for years before it became an issue. It's easy to look at an event that never took place and say, oh, I guess they just made all that up, when really you just didn't see all the time and effort that went into preventing said event from taking place. According to a Time Magazine article called 20 Years Later, the Y2K Bug Seems Like a Joke Because Those Behind the Scenes Took It Seriously, by Francine Unuma, quote, The innumerable programmers who devoted months and years to implementing fixes received scant recognition. One programmer recalls the reward for a five-year project at his company, lunch 
and a pin. It was a tedious, unglamorous effort, hardly the stuff of heroic narratives, nor conducive to an outpouring of public gratitude, end quote. That article also mentioned one name in particular that kept coming up over and over again, Peter DeYager. He's mentioned in the Time Magazine article, he's in a Washington Post article I read, he's in a Forbes article, the New York Times, Computer World Magazine, Google Y2K, and you will pretty quickly stumble upon the name Peter de Jager. And there's a good reason for that. Peter wrote a groundbreaking article for Computer World Magazine in 1993 called Doomsday 2000, in which he raised the alarm about the impending Y2K disaster. It was a call to action, a warning to the world to fix the computer issues before time ran out. He has been called the Paul Revere of Y2K. He also hosts a podcast called Y2K, an autobiography that I highly recommend if you're into this topic. So I reached out to him, not really expecting a response. And you guys, here he is. My name is Peter DeYager. I was an IT consultant speaker for the last four or five decades, and I'm now semi-retired. But the Y2K questions keep on coming. (laughs) So how did you get involved in Y2K? What first brought the matter to your attention? What were you doing in that world? At the time, I was a computer operator. I had just come out of university, where my studies included computer science. And one of those courses was numerical analysis. And we were worried about errors in the 10th decimal place on computers and how they could cause problems. As a computer operator, I'm there a couple of months, straight out of university, and I'm working on an MVS system, old big iron, big blue computing system that managed the telling, the teller machines across Canada, the ATMs and the bank tellers. It was called Colt, Canadian Online Tellers. And it was set up so that It managed all of these things across Canada. And if there was a problem, we had an air raid siren that would go off. Literally an air raid siren that told everybody the computer was down, bring it back up. Why? Because when it's down, there are tens of thousands of people trying to get at their money that can't. We're IPLing the computer, initial program load, in the morning to get it up and running. And one of the things we're doing is we're typing in the date. So we'll type in day, month, year. This is in 1978. When we type in the year, we don't type in 1978. We type in 78. And immediately, because I'm focused on errors and computers, I asked the question, it's a boundary question, it's a normal IT question, what happens when we type in zero, zero? And the answer is, it will assume the year is 1900. That means the entire banking system that we're running will not be operating correctly, which means that that air raid siren should literally go off and keep on going off until we fix the problem. I go to my boss, now this is 1978, I'm 23 years old. I go to my boss and say, we have a problem. He says, what's the problem? Because he knows I've only been there a couple of weeks. I said, in the year 2000, we're gonna have an issue. Your computer out there won't work. What do you mean it won't work? When we type in zero, zero, it'll have the year wrong. And he looks at me and he says, you're worried about a problem that isn't gonna happen for 22 years. Get out of my office. Someone will take care of it by then. A phrase that I heard time and time again over the years. And I was young and naive and I said, okay, someone will take care of it by then. I left, no one took care of it. 1989, I'm working for a place called Dilex. D-Y-L-E-X in Canada. We're using a system called PROFS, P-R-O-F-S, Professional Office Systems from IBM. And on January the 1st, 1990, 
the system went belly up, stopped working. Why? We were using a one year, a one digit year in that system. So when it went from 1989, nine, to 1990, a zero, it thought all the emails had expired. They'd been in there for 10 years, delete them all. So if they didn't fix that problem, and they weren't fixing the year 2000 problem, we had an issue. I still put it aside. Who am I? I'm a computer operator. I'm a computer person, but I'm nobody important. And I didn't worry about it until about 1992, where I'm going, I'm looking around and saying, no one's taking care of this. No, no one's looking at it. And we've got eight years left. And I'm a worry wart. I prefer to avoid problems than fix problems. So in 1993, I started to write articles. First one I wrote, Tick Tock, Tick Tock, was for Computing Canada. Totally ignored, except for being made fun of. Basically, here I am saying there's a problem that's going to happen you know, eight years from now. And people just poo-pooed it. And then I wrote, for whatever reason, uh, the Doomsday 2000 article that appeared in Computer World. Computer World at the time had a circulation, a weekly circulation of 800,000, I think. Or is it 350,000? It's a long time and I'm getting old. But it, had, uh, it was a featured article. And all of a sudden, everybody was talking about this thing. Most of them saying, this is nonsense. You know, we'll fix it. It's not an unknown problem. And they were right in that people had been talking about this for years. Mostly talk. Some people have been working on it. Uh, a Scottish bank, Widow's Bank in Scotland, had run into the problem in 1970 because they had 30-year mortgages. 30 on to 1970 gives you 2000, which means the closing date for their mortgages was the year 2000. That caused problems, which they fixed. They knew about it from 1970. And other companies knew about it as well, and were beginning to do something. But the vast majority of organizations were doing absolutely nothing. And some of them were totally oblivious to it. Others knew about it, but eh, don't worry about it. It'll get fixed. Someone will fix it by then. So I, I actually came across your name because of that article. I think it was the Doomsday 2000 article that you wrote. And I also saw mm -hmm. you referred to, I think it was like the New York Times or something, had referred to you as the Paul Revere of Y2K. Do you feel like that's accurate? Do you feel like you, you deserve that title? <laughs> well, I've also been called the Doomsayer and the Fearmonger of Y2K. Accurate? Look, I was making a tremendous amount of noise. I was writing an awful lot of articles. I was writing 10, 20, 30 articles a month. I was speaking all the way around the world. I've spoken in, I've spoken about 45 countries on this subject. I testified before governments on this subject. And I was, I was not going to go away. This needed to be, to be fixed. I was giddy excited to speak with Peter because he is the Y2K guy. And I just had so many questions for him. But before we get into more of that, let's start with the basics, like what Y2K even was. Because if you're much younger than I am, like even a few years younger, you probably don't even remember it. Y2K stands for year 2000, but it refers almost exclusively to a computer programming issue that arose. People often refer to it as a bug, but it wasn't really. It wasn't like a virus or anything. It was just a flaw in the way that they had set things up when computers first became a thing. Basically, what happened was in the early days of computers, which was honestly not all that long ago, we're talking mid-1900s, Memory was incredibly expensive. It also took up a ton of space, like physical space, rooms and rooms of space to store information. So only really necessary information was stored. It was kept to a bare minimum. One way they minimized this information storage was by shortening years to just two digits. So instead of 1960, it was just 60. They left off the 19. In 1964, IBM introduced their System 360 machines, which made computers a business necessity. These were much smaller machines, but still pretty huge. I mean, they fit in a room at least, but they were roughly the size of like a double refrigerator and they weighed a few thousand pounds at least. Also, they cost $2 million. 
So most businesses just rented them for around $20,000. But while this was a major upgrade that made computers much more accessible, they kept the same system of just using two digits for the year. And with each new upgrade, the year remained just two digits. So to cut to the chase here, at some point, people started to think, huh, what's going to happen when we get to the end of the century, when 99 turns into 00? How will the computers know that it's 2000 and not 1900? We haven't given them that information. And I get the whole saving space, cutting down on memory, cutting down on cost of memory. I get that. But I cannot understand why they didn't foresee this problem from the very beginning. So I asked Peter. In 1970, in 1980, someone writing a system and they're using a two-digit date. It's a compromise. And they go, yeah, yeah, but it won't work in the year 2000. Yeah, don't worry about that. That's 20 years from now. We won't be using the software anymore. We won't be using the system anymore. And quite literally, we did not know how computer systems evolve over time. There's this perception, an initial perception. It doesn't bear close examination, but there's an initial accept, uh, perception that we will replace it. Well, that's not how it happens. If I have an, account, if I have an accounting system, there are two components to the accounting system. One is the data, and the other one is the program itself, the code. Now, if you want to modify the system, quite often you'll get rid of the code. But there's no reason to get rid of the data. And if the data is using a two-digit year, then your new code will tend to use the two-digit year data. You're not going to spend the extra money to revamp, to, you know, to go through all of your data and make changes to all of your data to move it to four-digit years. That's an awful expense. Because management will say to you, well, isn't there a cheaper way that we can do this? And you go, yeah, we could bring in the two-digit year. We can make some assumptions. Okay, then do that. But, 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 no, 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 do that. Let someone else worry about it 20 years down the line, which is what happened. And to this day, it's like railway tracks. Why are railway tracks the width they are? And the story is, I don't know how true it is, but that's the width of wagon wheels. So when you're building a railway, you make it that length. So we have railway systems around the world that have been designed that way because that's how wide wagon wheels were apart 200 years ago. Uh, stretching the example a bit. But that's what happens in computers as well, is that old habits keep propagating because it's simply cheaper to do it that way. Now... This might not seem like a huge deal, computers not knowing what year it is. And they certainly didn't anticipate how big of a deal it would become when they first made the decision to shorten the year. And at first, it was just minor, almost comical issues cropping up. According to a Guardian article, in 1988, a case of canned meat was rejected by a supermarket after being flagged as expired. The expiration date said 00 which computers were reading as 1900 instead of 2000. And that made the meat 88 years expired instead of good for another 12. In 1992, a Minnesota woman named Mary Bandar was prompted to register for kindergarten because computers thought she was four years old. In fact, Mary was 104 years old, but her birth in the computer, the year of her birth just said 88. How was it to know that that meant 1888 and not 1988? It only knew this one century. But as we approached the turn of the millennium, we became more and more dependent on computers for things like banking, utilities, power plants, transportation, buses and air traffic, military missiles and such. And if all of these systems went haywire at the stroke of midnight in the year 2000, it could lead to an absolute breakdown of society. If the power failed, if people couldn't get their money out of the banks, if transportation stopped or airplanes fell out of the sky, if missiles were accidentally launched, nuclear weapons detonated, it was potentially a recipe for an apocalypse brought on by technological failure. I asked Peter how grave the situation really was. The truth is we don't know. 
The honest truth is we don't know because we don't know how computer systems fail in advance. Computer systems are like that. It doesn't matter if you're talking about gaming systems, if you're talking about banking systems, you literally don't know how it's going to fail. And when you ask how bad could it get, we're into the realm of speculation, which always gets us into trouble. If you go back, go on the internet and Google Therac 25, T-H-E-R-A-C 25, that was a system designed to give radiation treatment to cancer victims. It had a computer problem. There was a programming error. And Therac 25 killed people. It gave them too much radiation and killed them. That's a computer software problem. So when you ask how bad could it get, well, it's a life and death issue. Not in all systems. If your banking statement is wrong, if the interest calculation is incorrect, no one's going to die because of that. But your bank has a serious problem. If all of their customers, millions of customers in a bank, are all getting the wrong statements, then your system doesn't work. And it means that millions of people are locked out of your system now. They can't use your system. Every now and then in our society, we'll have a problem with telecommunications. We had one in Canada a couple of years ago where Rogers, our main provider of internet and telecommunication services in Canada, went down for a couple of days. And the ripple effect was astounding. Not only couldn't you get on the internet, but you, can't, you also couldn't go into a store and use your ATM card. You couldn't use the ATMs. You couldn't use parking meters. You couldn't get into parking lots. You couldn't get onto some elevators because the telecommunications between the elevator and the computer system wasn't working. So it's only when things fail that we get a real sense of how much we depend upon things. And Y2K was all about the dependency. In the podcast that you mentioned, Y2K and autobiography, I use the word coined by Ted Nelson. Everything is intertwingled. Everything is connected to, its, to, to everything else. And Y2K was like that. So when you ask, how bad could it get? How long can you live without your banking system? How long could you live without the airline systems being able to manage planes in the sky? How long could you live if uh, the shipping lanes if you don't know where the ships are because of some problem. Now, are those things likely because of Y2K? We don't know. We don't know until it fails or until you test it. A lot of organizations, and this is what they did, they went in and tested their systems. And again, their systems went belly up. And it would take them months to fix. One of the solutions proffered by some people was, you know, fix on failure. Don't do anything. Let it fail and then fix it. Okay, and that's fine if the problem that occurs is one you can fix within 24 hours. But if it turns out to be one that will take you three or four months, you know, how would you feel if you didn't have internet for three or four months, if you couldn't get at your ATM for three or four months? And that was the issue. It had to be fixed before it failed. After some initial dragging of feet that annoyed Peter to no end, most of the world finally started to act. In 1996, a U.S. senator from New York named Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote a letter to then-President Bill Clinton to alert him of the results of a study carried out by the Congressional Research Service. In this letter, he says, quote, Each line of computer code needs to be analyzed and either passed on or be rewritten. The computer has been a blessing. If we don't act quickly, however, it could become the curse of the age. End quote. Each line of computer code. I don't profess to know much about computer programming, but I know that analyzing each line of computer code that existed was an absolutely colossal job. And this is what finally got the ball rolling in the U.S. after years of ignored warnings. Clinton launched a council on Y2K conversion. In a 1998 speech, he said, quote, 
If we act properly, we won't look back on this as a headache, sort of the last failed challenge of the 20th century. It will be the first challenge of the 21st century successfully met, end quote. He also said, quote, any business that approaches the new year armed only with a bottle of champagne and a noisemaker is likely to have a very big hangover New Year's morning, end quote. The rest of the world sprang into action, too. The United Nations convened an international conference on Y2K, and the World Bank backed the International Y2K Cooperation Center to help other countries prepare. And this, if you couldn't tell from that $1 trillion price tag, was a massive undertaking that had to be completed in a relatively short amount of time with a very finite deadline. It's a really simple problem to understand if you're a techie. If you're not a techie, it becomes really complicated. But if you're a techie, it's really, really simple to test and verify that, yeah, this is an issue. And that's what a lot of banks did. They started rolling zero, zero data into their systems, and their systems just went, they just died. And at that point, they put together projects, projects costing upwards of $100 million in a single organization because it's a convoluted problem. You have millions of lines of code in a typical large organization. Somewhere in those millions of lines of code, there are some lines that are bad that will not operate properly. So your challenge is to find them and then fix them. And you have to decide how you're gonna fix them. And you're gonna decide which parts of your system are you gonna fix first because they feed data into other systems. It's like that game of pickup sticks, where you plonk a bunch of sticks onto the table. There's a hundred sticks, they're all overlapping each other, and you have to pull one out without disturbing anything else. And you have to keep doing that until they're all taken off the table. That's what Y2K was like. It was large, and it was like counting grains of sand on the beach. It wasn't difficult, but it was large and tedious, and boring, and you would get no credit for it at the end, especially if it succeeded and you got it right. So what exactly was done to fix it? What went, What all went into fixing it? All types of things. The first thing was an inventory. You actually had to take account of everything that you owned. Most organizations had no clue what computer systems they had. They knew they had some major ones, but they didn't know how they interacted. So first off, you had to take a picture, a snapshot of what systems do you have? How do they interconnect with each other? And once you've had that, got that in inventory, you'll know which are the important systems and which ones are secondary systems. You're gonna fix the, the important ones first. Now, how do you fix it? All types of solutions. The ideal solution, if you had the time and the money, was expand all the digits and all the systems and all the data to four digits. That would solve the problem until the year 99. But that's expensive. Another one is get rid of the old system, just throw it away and buy a new one. Total replacement. Another one was go in and say, okay, we've got two digit years and we know it's on zero, zero, it's going to assume it's 1900. So let's put in some code that says when it's anywhere from zero, zero to 20, assume that it's 2000. So 2000, zero, zero, 2001, 2003, make that assumption up until the year 20. Uh, one proviso, you need to go back in at some point and bring that up to date. Because if you don't, then you're gonna have some problems in 2020. And lo and behold, on January the 1st, 2020, we had Y2K problems. The parking meters in New York City stopped working because they wouldn't accept credit cards. Why? Because they had that windowing thing I just described uh, set up for the year 20, and they didn't go back in and fix it. So there was no parking meter. You couldn't park in New York City. There was uh, a cash register terminal type device in Poland. All of them stopped working in January 2020. Why? A year 2000 problem, the one I've just described. There were trains in Belgium that wouldn't start. Why? Because of the 2020 problem, the year 2000 problem that hadn't been fixed, that had been patched, a temporary patch, like a Band-Aid, 
and you hadn't gone back in and replaced the Band-Aid and put a new one on, which you could have done. You could have made it easy too, but we didn't. And sometimes these things just snuck through. Did you feel pretty confident kind of coming up on, on New Year's Eve 1999? Did you feel pretty confident that most of the issues had been fixed? How did you spend that New Year's Eve? Well, first off, in about March of 1999, I wrote an article called Doomsday Avoided, where I basically said we'd broken the back of Y2K. Uh, there would be no significant problems. We'd taken care of all the major issues that... While there would be some problems, our mission critical systems had been fixed and not to worry. Where was I? I was on a plane flying from Chicago to Heathrow. At the stroke of midnight, I was at 32,000 feet above Newfoundland, above Yander to be specific, and not a care in the world. I wasn't worried at all that there would be a problem. For the most part, we fixed it. Did we get everything? No, we didn't. We didn't get everything. Were there problems? Yeah. Were most of them reported to the media? Not a chance. No sane organization is going to call up the media on January the 1st, 2000 and say, oh, by the way, we have a Y2K problem. We can't get into your accounts. They're not going to do that. So what problems we did have were fixed on the fly very, very quickly because we'd done all that preliminary work. But despite all of the hard work behind the scenes to prevent a Y2K disaster, the fairly immediate response was, oh, they tricked us. It was all a hoax. And part of what added to that sentiment was that certain people had taken advantage of the situation, extorting the public fear about a possible apocalypse to try to make some money. This was especially prevalent within the religious sector, where many began to think Y2K was the beginning of the rapture, the beginning of the end. People started selling videos and books about how to survive the end times, survival guides and survival kits at exorbitant prices. According to a Forbes magazine article, a Massachusetts company marketed an $89 Y2K survival kit that included an abacus, a flashlight, and a compass. Which, like, an abacus? How much math are you really going to be doing at the end of the world? Plus, you know they make solar-powered calculators, right? I don't get it. But the point is, where there is money to be made, there are always people willing to make it, no matter how slimy their business practices are. If you've seen the show The Righteous Gemstones, highly recommend, it's hilarious, this is a big plot point in that show, selling overpriced survival kits leading up to Y2K. So it happened, you know, because it wasn't a fictional television show. No, but it, it really did happen. IT companies were also making a ton of money. According to that same Forbes article, quote, Looking back a decade later, a senior VP of tech for Ace Hardware said, Y2K put IT on the map. The CIO of an offshore drilling company agreed. It was a cathartic time, one of the best things that ever happened to IT. An executive of AMC Computer wistfully recalled, we made a lot of money on it. A lot of folks thought the gravy train would never end, end quote. So you look at that and the fact that not much happened and you go, hmm, there was motivation to make this up. Certain people made a lot of money. Maybe they just made it all up, which just... Side note, some things did happen, but they were relatively minor. According to a Guardian article by Martin Thomas, a software engineer and cybersecurity expert, quote, There were many failures in January 2000, from the significant to the trivial. Many credit card systems and cash points failed. Some customers received bills for 100 years' interest, while others were briefly rich for the same reason. Internationally, 15 nuclear reactors shut down. The oil pumping station in Umertalik failed, cutting off supplies to Istanbul. There were power cuts in Hawaii, and government computers failed in China and Hong Kong. A customer at a New York State video rental store had a bill for $91,250, the cost of renting the film The General's Daughter for 100 years. End quote. So stuff happened, but it wasn't bad enough to deter thoughts of a Y2K hoax. Plus, like Peter said, these big companies weren't necessarily reporting these issues to the media. People also pointed to the fact that certain countries like Italy, Russia, and South Korea did very little to remedy the problem, and they were just fine. So I asked Peter about this. First off, not every system had the, had the problem. 
okay? It, it's simply not every computer system had the problem. The mistake we made, and we did make the mistake, we thought Italy would be worse. What we didn't factor in, and maybe we should have, it's an oversight, is that in Italy, most of the systems run by large organizations. First off, if you're a multinational, you don't have to do anything. Head office is taking care of it. So there's one thing that factors into that. Multinationals, if their head office was doing something, then the branch offices didn't need to do anything. And secondly, and I think this is the most important one, is that many countries, unlike America, Australia, New Zealand, England, and places like that, bought systems. They didn't build systems. Okay. In North America, we built systems from scratch. We were building systems in the 1960s, in the 1970s, in the 1980s. We built our own in-house accounts payable. Italy didn't do that. Italy went out and bought SAP. They, they bought some type of product off the shelf. And if that company had bought that product off the shelf, then the company, the vendor who sold it to them was taking care of it. But the individual companies didn't need to. And the other thing, they weren't as automated as we were. You know, if you have a Y2K problem on a PC, who cares? If it's on a PC, it's not that big a deal in the first place. PCs didn't run the world back then. Now, today, I'd have to change my opinion on that. But back then, they weren't mission-critical systems. So we made a miscalculation, one, in how necessary it was for certain countries to act on this. And the other one is we misread how much they were actually doing. We underestimated how much they were doing. And that was the reason. The reason for that was simple. We, we did surveys. Surveys were done of how much work could be done. But a survey would take six months from when it was taken to when it was reported. So we were always looking at six months, data that's six months old. And we were making calculations on that. There were some countries that didn't have problems. But the ones who spent money on it understand something. They didn't spend money on this because I was making noise or anyone else was writing an article or telling them. They spent money on this because they went into their systems, tested their systems, and the systems broke. That's why they spent money. No one spent money because Peter Diager or anyone else said there was a Y2K problem. That's not why they spent money. They spent it because they tested, it failed, and they went, oh, crap. And now they have to go and do something. It's almost a compliment uh, to you that people would be um, would think that <laughs> that you had so yeah. much influence over these huge, huge companies. But yeah, that doesn't really make sense, does uh, it? I'm a good speaker. I'm not that good a speaker. <laughs> I mean, I know what I'm doing when I'm communicating and when I'm writing an article. But the reality is, is that no one really listens to that. They might take some guidance from what I said and what others said. But when it comes right down to it, they didn't spend a dime until they proved to themselves that this, this was an issue. Right. So do you feel like, I mean, I, I was 11 years old in 1999, but I remember the hype. I mean, I remember every, the tension and everyone talking about it. And do you feel like all that hype was warranted or do you feel like the whole Y2K thing kind of got blown out of proportion in the media as things it, so often do? There is no doubt in my mind that it got out of control. Mm -hmm. See, look, when I was communicating and speaking and writing, I'm writing to the IT audience. I'm writing to the technical audience. I'm speaking to the techno technical audience. I'm not really speaking to the layperson out there. I am really not focused on them. There's nothing they can do. The only ones who can solve this are the ones who are in control, which are managers and directors and executives and programmers and developers. You know, th those people can fix it. But the problem is when you're communicating, other people overhear the story. And the media love the story. I mean, the, the media absolutely love the story because it bleeds. It's a doom and gloom. Time magazine, the end of the world. Uh, Newsweek magazine, the end of the world, you know, covers. Uh, people loved it. Even Wired magazine. Wired magazine did an interview with me in 1999 that lasted about three or four hours. Three or four hours on the phone speaking to these folks. And we were talking about the power systems and everything else. And I was staying over and over and over again. We no longer have an issue. 
There will not be blackouts. There will not be this. And then they have the issue that's the black cover. And the black cover is basically the blackout Y2K story in Wired magazine. Now, I'd spent three or four hours on this thing. I am supposedly, as per your statement, the Paul Revere of Y2K. Not one word that I mentioned in that interview got into that article. It was an article that was a doom and gloom article. None of the positive stuff that I had to say, that I had evidence for, was ever included in that article. Right, you weren't yeah, telling them what they wanted to hear. <laughs> the, yeah, uh, the media sells based on fear. Now, some will say, well, Peter, you were using fear to get this thing done. And to an extent, yeah. If you don't fix this, then it will break. How will it break? I don't know. What would be the worst? I don't know. But I know it will break. And you can prove to yourself it'll break by, by testing. My goal right from the start was never to get someone to fix their code. My goal was to get someone to test their code. Because I don't need to argue or convince you that if the code breaks, that you need to fix it. You're smart enough to do that on your own. All I want you to do is test it. And I had people come up to me after a talk and go, Mr. Yarger, I believe you're full of it. I'm going to go back and test my systems. And when our systems come back and they're all okay, I'm going to go to the media and call you and tell you that, tell them that you're a charlatan. I said, okay, go ahead. And two weeks later, I'll get a phone call. Mr. Viagra, we apologize. We're absolutely wrong. Our systems went belly up. They're all dead. And we'll be spending $50 million to, um, to fix this. So I think about, you know, I think about what, what we use technology for in the 90s. And then I think about what we use it for now. And it's just grown so exponentially. We're so much more dependent on it now than ever before. Do you foresee future problems because oh. of technological issues like this? E eternally. <laughs> no, we'll never get away from this. Look, we have another problem coming up in 2038. Uh, this is a Unix date rollover thing. It's very similar to Y2K. If you ask me how significant it will be, I honestly don't know because I haven't invested the time. I mean, you might think that's strange, but I had time enough and energy enough for one problem. The 2038 one I'll leave to someone else. I'm, what am I? I'm 69 now, or I will be in January. In another, what, another 10 years, I'll be seven. I'm not going to be carried. I don't care. Someone else can handle it. We have another problem coming up in 2100. I won't be here for that one either. 2100 is it a leap year it's divisible um, or I, I would guess so yeah <laughs> not, it's not a leap year it's divisible by four which is the first rule but it's also divisible by 100 which means it won't be a leap year we got lucky in the year 2000 because the next one is is it divisible evenly divisible by 400 in the year 2000 was so it became a leap year again. But 2100 is not a leap year. Now I can stand today in front of an audience of IT people and ask the question, raise your hand if you believe 2100 is a leap year. And about a third of the hands will go up. And they've written code. That code is running the systems today. When it gets to 2100, it's gonna be wrong. And there will be issues. How big? Eh, not that big. We have problems every leap year. Uh, it's coming up leap year next year. We'll have problems next year. Just keep out, keep a lookout for leap year computing problems. And you'll see them on February the 29th of next year. Well, it happens every time. 2100 will be bigger. But how big, I don't know. I remember back when I was in the postpartum sleep-deprived fog of new motherhood, and desperately researching everything I could about how to survive a newborn, how to get him to sleep, how to get him to eat enough, how to get him to stop crying. I remember stumbling across one bit of advice in particular that has really stuck with me. It said, start how you want to end. And what I took that to mean was there are a lot of crutches, shortcuts that make things easier now pacifiers and co-sleeping and such that make things easier in the beginning. And don't come at me, moms. I know these crutches are sometimes necessary for survival, but they actually make things harder later when your kid is way too old and refusing to get rid of the pacifier, when you still can't get them to sleep in their own bed years later and every night is a battle. 
Sometimes shortcuts turn into long cuts. Shortening the year to just two digits seemed like a convenient hack back in the 1960s, but with the new century fast approaching, they couldn't end that way, and the process of fixing it was much more difficult and costly than if they had just done it right from the start. A week of sleep training your baby sucks. It's the worst. It's actual torture. But it's still better than years of sleep deprivation, bedtime battles, and feeling like you never get a minute to yourself. Start how you want to end. And if you can't, then be prepared to spend a great deal of time and energy fixing it later, or hope that there's an army of IT nerds willing to fix it for you, devoting hours and hours of tedious, mind-numbingly boring work to quite possibly save the world with little to no recognition whatsoever. And it boggles my mind when people say this was a hoax. The perception that it's a hoax is based upon the fact that nothing really happened right you know nothing really well things did happen norad was down for three days banking systems had problems no atm machines one of the reasons why atm machines worked perfectly because so much effort went into making sure that the atms worked why because if the atms didn't work around y2k it would have prompted a run on the banks. Mm -hmm. You had to get that right because everybody would see it if it didn't work. So we got it to work. So a tremendous amount of effort went in. And to be honest, the people who worked on this, never, not me, I'm talking about the programmers who worked long hours, they never got credit. I, I know people who have been told to take Y2K off their resume. Y2K was the most phenomenal IT project we've ever had. IT projects, by their nature, are always late. Always late. We weren't late on Y2K. It was a deadline that would not go away. And we did what we needed to do to get it done. Thank you all so very much for listening to History Fix. I hope you found this story interesting and maybe you even learned something new. Please do check out Peter de Jager's podcast, Y2K and Autobiography, for more. I've linked to that in the description. Be sure to follow my Instagram at History Fix Podcast to see some images that go along with this episode and to stay on top of new episodes as they drop. I'd also really appreciate it if you would rate and follow this podcast on whatever app you're using to listen. That'll make it much easier to get your next fix. Information used in this episode was sourced from the Y2K and Autobiography podcast hosted by Peter DeYager, National Geographic, Time Magazine, The Guardian, The Washington Post, Forbes Magazine, Computer World Magazine, The New York Post, The Conversation, The Smithsonian National Museum of American History, and The New York Times. As always, links to these sources can be found in the show notes.